As developers, we obsess over frameworks, APIs, clean code. But behind every application, every line of business logic, there's something deeper. Something that doesn't just store data, it organizes reality. The flight you booked, the money you transferred, the video you're watching right now, all of it runs on one foundational system, the database. From punch cards to vector embeddings, from airline mainframes to quantum storage, databases have silently shaped every era of computing. And yet most developers barely scratch the surface of what they really are. This isn't just about storage, it's about structure, power, control. This is the story of the most important system in computer science, and the one most taken for granted. This is the story of the database. The year is 1801. In a textile mill outside Lyon, France, Joseph-Marie Jacquard threads a series of punched cards into his revolutionary loom. Each hole represents a decision, each pattern a memory. Fast forward to 1880, the United States faces a crisis of scale. The census has grown so massive that tabulating it by hand will take nearly a decade. By the time they finish counting, the data will be obsolete. Enter Herman Hollerith, a young inventor obsessed with efficiency. Watching a train conductor punch tickets, he has an epiphany. What if data could be punched into cards and read by machines? His electromechanical tabulating machine processes the 1890 census in a fraction of the time about two years, instead of the nearly eight it took a decade earlier. The government saves millions. Hollerith founds a company that will eventually become IBM, and for the next 70 years, the punched card becomes the universal language of data. But this mechanical age has a fatal flaw. Data is physical, fragile, limited. As the world grows more complex, the cards multiply. Storage rooms become warehouses. Warehouses become entire buildings. Something has to give. The 1950s bring magnetic tape and the first electronic computers. Data becomes invisible, stored as patterns of magnetism. But there's still a problem. To find information, you have to know exactly where it lives. Imagine trying to find a single customer record among millions. You'd have to search through every tape in order from beginning to end. It could take hours or days. This is the world Charles Bachman enters in the early 1960s. A pragmatic engineer at General Electric, Bachman is tired of watching programmers waste days searching for data. He has a radical idea. What if data could point to other data? What if records could be linked, like a web of connections? His integrated data store, IDS, becomes the first true database management system, using a network model that links records through predefined relationships. Data finally has structure, relationships, memory. But Buckman's breakthrough is just the beginning. Across the country, a chance encounter on an airplane is about to prove that databases aren't just tools, they're weapons. American Airlines President C.R. Smith is flying from Los Angeles to New York when he strikes up a conversation with the passenger beside him, an IBM salesman named R. Blair Smith. The airline executive has a problem. American's reservation system is drowning in its own success. Operators spend hours searching through handwritten cards. Double bookings are common. Flights take off half empty while passengers are told they're sold out. The two Smiths, no relation, shake hands on the most ambitious data project ever attempted. They call it Sabery semi-automated business research environment. The scale is staggering. Two IBM 7090 mainframes, each the size of a small house. $40 million, nearly 400 million in today's money. A network spanning the continent. When Sabre goes live in 1964, it's processing 83,000 phone calls per day. Booking time drops from hours to seconds, but Sabre becomes something more than a reservation system. It becomes a competitive weapon. In the deregulated 1980s, American programs Sabre with a secret bias. Their flights always appear first on travel agent screens, regardless of price or convenience. Competitors are buried on page two, where no one looks. The scheme works for years until competitors catch on. Congressional investigations follow, new regulations are passed. But the lesson is clear, whoever controls the database, controls the game. Sabre proves that databases can operate at planetary scale, in real time. But it also reveals their limitations. The system is rigid hierarchical, navigational. To find data, programmers must chart a specific course through predefined paths, change the structure, and everything breaks. By 1970, the database world is ready for a revolution. It's about to get one, from the most unlikely source, a British mathematician working inside the belly of the beast. Before we continue our journey through the story of databases, let's hear from today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by CodeRabbit.ai, an AI-powered code review assistant built for developers who want to write smarter, not harder.
CodeRapid integrates directly with GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and Azure DevOps to deliver immediate, context-aware reviews. It summarizes pull requests, analyzes your entire code base, highlights bugs and inconsistencies, and even offers one-click suggestions and improvements. Best of all, Pro features are completely free for open source projects, making it accessible for anyone contributing to public code bases. For private or enterprise workflows, CodeRabbit intelligently adapts to your team's coding style, supports in-ID feedback via VS Code, Cursor, Windsurf, and integrates with tools like Jira and Linear for seamless issue tracking. Because the best developers don't just write code, they write it with clarity, intention, and a little help from something smarter. Try it today at CodeRabbit.ai. Now, let's get back to the story. Edgar Frank Codd is not your typical IBM employee. While his colleagues build bigger, more complex navigational systems, this British mathematician is asking a dangerous question. What if we're doing everything wrong? Cod sees the database world's dirty secret. Every query requires a programmer to navigate a specific path through the data, change the structure, and thousands of programs break. It's like rebuilding every roadmap each time you add a new street. His solution is elegantly simple. Store data in tables, rows and columns, like a spreadsheet. Let relationships emerge from the data itself not from rigid hierarchies, most revolutionary of all. Let users describe what they want, not how to get it. In June 1970, COD publishes a relational model of data for large shared data banks. 12 pages that will reshape the digital world. But IBM's reaction is swift and brutal. The company has invested millions in IMS, their hierarchical database. COD's relational model threatens to make it obsolete. Internal memos dismiss his work as academic theory, too slow, too resource intensive, impossible to implement. Cod becomes a prophet without honor in his own company, but his paper ignites a fire in the academic world. At UC Berkeley, two researchers read his work and see the future. Michael Stonebreaker and Eugene Wong are not content to theorize. With government funding, they launch Project Ingress, Interactive Graphics and Retrieval System. Their mission, prove that Cod's relational model can work in the real world. Ingress becomes a training ground for a generation of database pioneers. Students who will go on to found Oracle, Sybase and Informix all cut their teeth on Stonebreaker's project. It's the database equivalent of the Homebrew Computer Club. Meanwhile, deep inside IBM's San Jose Research Lab, a small team finally gets permission to explore COD's ideas. Their project, System R. Unlike the academic ingres, System R is designed for industrial strength, real companies, real data, real problems. Two researchers, Don Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce, face a crucial challenge. How do you let non-programmers query a database? Their answer becomes the most important computer language you've never heard of, SQL, Structured English Query Language. Select customer name from orders where amount 1000. It reads like English, but it's actually a mathematical query that can search millions of records in seconds. The 1970s become a decade-long race, Ingress, the academic rebel, System R, the corporate skunkworks. Both teams overcome immense technical challenges, proving that COD's vision isn't just theory, it's the future. By 1979, both projects have succeeded beyond their creator's wildest dreams. The relational model works. It's fast, flexible, and powerful. But there's one problem. IBM still won't commercialize it. The company is making too much money from IMS to cannibalize their own product. This hesitation creates an opening, and a young programmer named Larry Ellison is about to drive a truck through it. Larry Ellison has read COD's papers. He studied the system R research, and he sees what IBM cannot, the biggest business opportunity in computing history. With partners Bob Miner and Ed Oates, Ellison founds Relational Software Inc. Their plan is audacious, build a commercial relational database from scratch, make it compatible with IBM's SQL language and beat IBM to market. Working with a tiny team and minimal funding, they race against time. IBM has unlimited resources but corporate inertia. The startup has no resources but unlimited hunger. In 1979, Relational Software ships the first commercial SQL database. They call it Oracle. IBM, the inventor of the technology, is still two years away from their own product. Ellison's timing is perfect. The mini-computer revolution is making computing affordable for smaller companies. Oracle runs on these cheaper machines, while IBM's databases require expensive mainframes. Oracle's sales explode. The company goes public in 1986, making Ellison one of the richest people in America. But their success forces IBM's hand. IBM finally enters the relational market with DB2 in 1983. With the full weight of Big Blue's sales force behind it, DB2 becomes an instant force in the mainframe world. The stage is set for the database wars. Oracle, the scrappy startup with superior technology. IBM, the established giant with deeper pockets and customer relationships. The real victory comes in 1986 when the American National Standards Institute adopts SQL as the official standard for relational databases. 
What started as IBM's SQL becomes the universal language of data. Standardization changes everything. Applications can work with different databases. Programmers can move between companies without learning new languages. The relational model doesn't just win, it conquers. But power corrupts, even in the database world. Remember Sabre. In the deregulated 1980s, American Airlines uses its reservation system as a weapon, programming bias into search results to favor their own flights. When competitors discover the manipulation, the scandal reaches Congress. New regulations force transparency, but the lesson is clear. Databases aren't neutral. They reflect the intentions of their creators. By 1990, the relational model has won. SQL is the lingua franca of data, but a new force is emerging that will challenge everything, the World Wide Web, and with it, a new kind of data that doesn't fit neatly into rows and columns. The World Wide Web brings a new kind of chaos. Multimedia files, hyperlinked documents, complex, nested objects that laugh at the rigid structure of relational tables. Developers face a new problem, the object relational impedance mismatch. Their code thinks in objects, customers, orders, products, but their databases think in tables, rows, and columns. The translation is painful and slow. For a brief moment, it seems like object-oriented databases might be the answer. Store objects directly, preserve their complexity, eliminate the translation layer. Companies like Objectivity and Versant raise millions in funding. But the revolution never comes. The relational model is too entrenched. SQL is too universal. The object database movement becomes a footnote in history. By the early 2000s, a new problem emerges. Scale. Companies like Google and Amazon are processing more data in a day than most organizations see in a lifetime. Traditional databases designed for single powerful servers begin to crack under the pressure. Google faces an impossible challenge. Index the entire web. Billions of pages, trillions of links, petabytes of data. No single database can handle this load. Their solution is radical. Abandon the relational model's guarantees. Instead of one perfect database, build systems that run on thousands of cheap servers. Accept that some data might be temporarily inconsistent. Prioritize availability over perfection. In 2006, Google publishes the Bigtable paper. In 2007, Amazon releases the Dynamo paper. These aren't just research, they're blueprints for a new kind of database. The papers ignite an open source revolution. Facebook creates Cassandra for inbox search. TenGen builds MongoDB for web applications. The NoSQL movement is born. Not only SQL. The old world promised acid, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. The new world offers base, basically available, soft state, eventual consistency. It's a fundamental trade-off, perfect consistency for massive scale. Today's developers don't choose between relational and NoSQL, they use both. A single application might combine PostgreSQL for transactions, Redis for caching, Elasticsearch for search, and Neo4j for recommendations. The cloud changes everything again. Databases become services, auto-scaling, self-healing, paper use, Amazon's DynamoDB, Google's Firestore, Microsoft's Cosmos DB, the infrastructure becomes invisible. And now, artificial intelligence demands yet another revolution. Vector databases like Pinecone and Milvus store not data but meaning, high-dimensional representations of text, images, and sound that enable semantic search and AI-powered applications. The modern developer is a data architect, choosing the right tool for each job. Key value stores for speed, document databases for flexibility, graph databases for relationships, time series databases for IoT. The one-size-fits-all era is over. From Jacquard's punched cards to Google's planet-spanning systems, the database has evolved from a simple storage mechanism into the nervous system of our digital civilization. Remember the FAA crisis in January 2023? A corrupted database file brought the US air travel system to a standstill. Thousands of flights delayed or canceled, the fix took hours and a coordinated national effort, but the real story isn't the failure, it's that such failures are so rare. Every second, databases process millions of transactions, credit card payments, social media posts, GPS coordinates, medical records, the invisible architecture that makes modern life possible. Today's database developers face challenges that would have seemed impossible to Hollerith or COD. Planetary scale, real-time processing, AI integration, edge computing, the Internet of Things, the next revolution is already beginning. Quantum databases that exist in superposition. Neural interfaces that store memories directly. Blockchain systems that eliminate the need for trust. But the fundamental challenge remains the same as it was for Jacquard in 1801. How do we organize information so that machines can understand it? How do we build systems that scale with human ambition? We create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. By the end of 2025, the global data sphere will reach 175 zettabytes. That's 175 trillion gigabytes. 
the database isn't just a tool anymore, it's the foundation of human knowledge. From Hollerith's tabulating machines to COD's mathematical elegance, from Ellison's entrepreneurial audacity to Google's distributed vision, each generation of database pioneers has faced the same fundamental challenge. How do we tame the chaos of information? The database is the invisible architecture of our connected world. Every click, every search, every transaction flows through systems built by dreamers who saw order in chaos, structure in randomness, and possibility in data. The story continues. Every day, every query, every line of code, the invisible architecture grows stronger, more intelligent, more essential, and somewhere, a new pioneer is writing the next chapter, 